What's happening party people? Welcome to Punch Board Party. My name is Daniel and today we are talking about the top five board games for families. Now again, this is not to be confused with top five family games. If you go on to Board Game Geek and you look in their family game category, you're going to find games like Wingspan, Lost Ruins of Arnak, Everdell, Azul, and these are all excellent games and excellent games for families I suppose but they require a little bit more introduction into the hobby so that these games don't overwhelm new players and so when I was thinking about my top five games for families I was thinking about grandma and grandpa I was thinking about the brother or sister who is kind of keeps to themselves when everyone else is playing board games. Games that could draw them to the table and draw them into the fun that the rest of the family is having. Kind of games that are low threshold entry points into the hobbies. Games that will ensure the most amount of fun for the most amount of people. This could be top five utilitarian board games if you wanted to call it that. So keep in mind these are my top five. These are what I bring to the table most often. If you notice the game boxes that I have around we got rips in them and we have banged up corners because I've kind of brought them everywhere. So these games are just excellent to have to bring fun to people's doorstep. So if you're looking for games for the whole family these are the ones that I'm going to recommend to you. Number five is For Sale. I absolutely love For Sale. Not just as games for families, but this is just a go-to game for me regardless. For Sale is played in two phases. One phase, 30 cards or a couple less might be taken out depending on player count, but they're going to be dealt out to players and they are numbers with little house pictures and properties on them and numbers are 1 to 30 and basically in the first few rounds these cards are going to be placed on the table and then you are going to be bidding for the highest card at the table so I might bid two and then another person will have to outbid me so they have to bid three and that just keeps going around the table until someone bids more than anybody else wants to bid. And in that case, the person who bid the most pays all their money to the bank and the other people get half of their money rounded down back to them. And then they get the other cards in sort of bidder's order. So like second highest bidder gets the second highest card, third highest bidder gets the third highest card, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you do that for a few rounds until you have a hand of property cards. And then the second half of the game, you're gonna deal out these money cards. And basically each player is gonna play a property card and highest property value is gonna get the highest money value and second highest property value is gonna get the second highest money value. And then you do that for a few rounds until all the money cards are gone. And then you're gonna tally up your money cards plus any leftover money that you may have. And whoever has the most money at the end of the game is the winner. This is excellent. It plays up to six players. So you can get quite a few people around the table for this. And it's also just really intuitive. This is just a really stripped down bidding game. People get that concept. They know how to bid and outbid one another and how to raise a bit higher, kind of call people's bluffs, this kind of thing. So it's a game that even if you did fairly poorly in the bidding phase, you're not stuck. You can still do really well at getting high value money cards by just strategically choosing when to play your low value cards and when to play your high value cards. And so I've just seen people uh, of all experience levels with games do really well at this game and have a really fun time. So for sale, that is my number five. Number four is The Mind. This is gangbusters. This is bananas. It's lower down on the list because it only plays up to four players, but I'm sure you could sneak in a couple more and it wouldn't break the game. But basically this game is just super, super simple. There's a deck of 100 cards, and in the first round, everyone has dealt out one card. In the second round, everyone's dealt out two cards. In the third round, three. Fourth round, four. All the way up, I think there's 12 rounds. But basically, this is a cooperative game where you're all playing and working together. And your goal is to play everybody's cards in sequential order. So basically, what we're trying to do is without talking, you can't talk to anybody, you can't gesture, you can't mime, 
no communication. So if I have a 10, I might be thinking, okay, this is pretty low. This could be the lowest card amongst us, but I don't know that for sure. And then I see that someone else is kind of moving their hand a little bit, kind of tempted. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll wait it off. And then they play and they play an 11. Ah! Oh! we lose and so we lose a life. You have three lives or so in a round and so that's the worst. And oh boy, the Ted shit. The conversations after a round of this game are so much fun to have. Like, oh, I thought I definitely had a higher card than you. I had a 97. I didn't know that you had a 90. Oh, you know, just lots of fun. Curtis picked up on this and was telling me when we played this together that you really get a sense for how people think about numbers and the distances between numbers and how big a gap is between 15 and 30 to some people isn't the same as for other people. And so it's just really funny to try and get on the same wavelength as other people as you're trying to work together to play these cards in order. And again, the game is getting harder and harder as you're adding more and more cards to the mix. And so this is just a delight. It is a blast. I highly recommend the mind. Number three on my list is Anomia. So this is kind of, you know, like it's almost mass market, off the shelf, simple card game. And I have just had the most fun and success bringing this out with a large group of people, you know, grandparents and cousins, nieces and nephews, just like this whole smorgasbord of people around and this game is a hit. Basically, you have a little deck of cards in front of you and they have words and symbols on them. And so basically you have this deck of cards cast sitting in front of you like this and everyone else has the same thing. And then what you do is you're flipping up cards in the center of the table and once a symbol matches somebody else's symbol, then the two people whose symbols are matching start yelling on an answer to the other person's card. So in this case, this card is lunch meat and my card is politician. So I'm trying to yell out a lunch meat faster than the opponent can yell out a politician. And so your brain just gets gummed up. Like the gears don't work because the other person who you're kind of competing against is immediately going, um, 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 um. And so you're trying to think through their ums <laughs> as you're saying, you know it, right? Like you're seeing it, like you're seeing roast beef or Montreal smoked meat or salami or whatever. And you're just like, Ugh! and you're trying to turn the picture into a word faster than they can for yours. And so basically what happens is when someone wins or says a word first, they get the other person's card and then it might reveal another symbol that might match someone else's. And so there could be this cascade event of people's symbols matching and they're all just having these mini fits of brain fury as they're trying to say a word faster than another. And so nothing complicated about this game, but just laughter ensues in spades. And so I truly recommend Anomia for families in a big way. This next game coming in at number two is a game that I do not own and I should, but Scott owns it and playing it at his place was such a surprise to me because here's the truth for me. These games that are really good for families aren't necessarily the games that I gravitate towards. They're not the games that I want to play right off the hop. And then I just have a blast with them and I think, okay, you know what? There's definitely room for these games here. This next game, Insider, fits in that category because this is a game that we've all played tons of times, just with a twist. Basically, this game is 20 questions where you have a player who has a word that they are trying to get other people to guess what it is. And so the other people are just asking questions. Is it an animal? Is it bigger than a house? And they're trying to narrow down what this thing is. But the catch is that there's hidden roles. So at the beginning of the game, everyone gets dealt out a role and usually it's just kind of a bunch of common players and then there is a master and there is an insider. Everyone closes their eyes and the master then looks at the board and there's a deck of cards and they flip a card over and on the back of the cards there's a number and then on the card's front, there's a list of words numbered one to six or whatever. If I look at the back of this card, it's a three. Then I look at the front of the card and it's a list of words. And I pick the third one. And that's the word that people are gonna be trying to guess from me by asking questions. I close my eyes and the insider opens their eyes. They get to see what the word is as well. Then everyone opens their eyes and they start asking questions. Here's the thing that makes this a blast. 
the insider is only going to win the game if everybody else guesses the correct answer. And so the insider is also asking questions in order to get the group on the right track for what the word is. So say the word is cactus and someone's asking a question and they say, is it a plant? And the person says, yes. And then the person asks, is it an indoor plant? And then it's kind of like, mm, sometimes, you know? And so then at that point, the insider can swoop in and ask a question that kind of gets things uh, to be more clear for the group. But they cannot be too brazen about it because the insider loses if the master is able to guess who the insider is at the end of the game. Being the insider is so much fun because you're, you're just kind of frustrated with the group as they're going off in all sorts of different directions. You're just trying to get people back on track without getting caught or called out as the insider yourself. So that's a blast. And then being just a normal player and trying to suss out who the insider is, is also so much fun. And so just this really great kind of social experiment in the form of a game. And so again, you're gonna have so much fun with insider. Um, really great to just bring the laughter out around the table. So last up and certainly not least, code names. The Juggernaut of family games. You know what, if you're not into hobby board games, you've probably still heard about code names uh, because this game is everywhere and people love it and for good reason. So this is a word game where you have a grid of 25 words out on the board and your party is divided into two teams, a red team and a blue team. And there is a spy master on each team that gets to look at the kind of secret code card or like the map. And what that does is it shows which words on this grid are blue words and which are red words. And so basically the spy master of each team, they're trying to give a one word clue attached to a number to their team. And so basically what they'll say is um, amazing for two. And uh, so that means that there's two words out on the grid that are their team's words for them to guess. What's really great about the game is again, just you thinking that you saying a particular clue is really obvious and the rest of the players on your team just not picking up on it or not thinking about things in nearly the same way as you are. And so what I love about this game, you really start to experience how beautifully different people are and you can just delight in that difference and in the quirkiness of the ways that people's minds work. And so again, for families, it really does bring you closer together um, when you have experiences of, I really thought you would get that. I was clearly saying this. Oh, I didn't realize, I didn't think about it that way. And now you know that they think that way about certain things. And it's not any sort of deep level that you grow closer necessarily, but it does just sort of create this sense of, I know the people that I played with a bit better than I did before, which is really great for any experience that you're having with families. So there we have it, party people. Those are my top five picks for board games to play with families, board games for families. These are just surefire fun. So go ahead, check these out, find them, buy them. You won't be disappointed. And by and large, these are really cheap games as well. So not a whole lot out of the wallet to get these to the table and have a good time. If you enjoy videos like this, top five lists, as well as learning about the new games that are coming out. That's kind of what this channel is all about. So if that sounds good to you, subscribe to the channel and engage in the comments below. I'm having a lot of fun getting to know you guys. And until next time, party people, have the best day.